Hey there, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kayvan Davani. I'm really looking forward to my next special guest, um, Kiara Bickers, author of Bitcoin Clarity, A Guide to Understanding Bitcoin. And sh- you should definitely check out her, uh, you know, her Twitter handle is Kiara Bickers, one word. And also check out her website, getbitcoinclarity.com. Her story is really fascinating, and that's what I wanna, partially want to dive into with her together. Uh, you know, her first epiphany. Uh, she's also like, um, you know, I like her open-minded um, and autodidact uh, approach to everything. She's um, admittedly, you know, self-admittedly on her website. Uh, she's a high school and college dropout. And, but then, you know, she is later on, she got interested into, you know, philosophy, Austrian economics, business psychology and mindset and uh, read a lot and taught herself like how to code a program and works at, you know, system administrator at Blockstream. So she's a real fascinating personality. So I think, you know, we should have more bright minds like Kara Bickers who bring more, you know, new, innovative, uh, fresh perspectives into the Bitcoin space. Uh, especially when it comes, you know, from a truly essence, essence, essence of, of, of a female, you know, um, uh, processing thinking. So that's um, because I see, you know, with Bitcoin, uh, uh, an evolution also in, in the social structures, breaking up this, you know, patriarchalic, uh, uh, very extremely male dominated um, civilization we have. Uh, so that's what we want to get into, get her perspective, because otherwise, uh, she's, uh, she's had some really beautiful, uh, she's done some beautiful interviews also with Citizen Bitcoin, should check it out. So I don't want to regurgitate, repeat, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the questions and topics that have already been discussed on other topic on other podcasts. So, um, yeah, so I hope you're going to enjoy this without further ado. This is my interview with Kiara Bickers. I'm really looking forward, really excited. And if you have any questions, hit me up hello at the totalconnected.com. If you're an ethical Bitcoin sponsor, please reach out to me. I'm looking out for, for sponsors so I can deliver more high quality, highest quality, you know, face-to-face interviews, going to, you know, different countries, events, conferences, and really deliver high, highly, you know, um, uh, quality, high quality uh, interviews, podcast, video interviews. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for support and for listening and see you soon. Kiara, thank you so much for coming to my show. How hey, thanks doing? for having me. <laughs> Great. Um, listen, Kiara, I, I, I got to be honest with you. I haven't had the chance to read your book yet because I was waiting for the, for the printed version on Amazon. But um, as all, for, like all the other Bitcoin authors, I'm going to make sure, first of all, that your book is going to be available on the University of Library, uh, University Library of Vienna. So, uh, Wonderful. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I won't hold it against you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, since you've already had, uh, you know, a wonderful conversation and talk with Brady from Citizen Bitcoin, and I just reheard it, re-listened to it today for the second time, I'm more in depth because the first one was a little more superficial. Um, it was, it was, it was just great the talk. So I'm not going to go uh, since I haven't read the, your book yet, uh, but I have somehow listened to your 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 motives, intentions, the purpose. Why did you sure. Why did you write the book? But I want to go, if you, if you don't mind, I want to go a little bit uh, different tangents of, of Absolutely. topics. Absolutely. Let's do okay? it. Because yeah. I, as it's I remember. It's more fun I took, for me. You uh-huh. know, like the, writing the book and, and rehashing out all the stuff in the book, as you might have noticed from that podcast, is the intent of the book was really much, to, was really to be visual and to explain this very complicated system in a visual way. Uh, that being said, it's hard to do over audio. You know, yeah. like it's hard to explain in words. I do it as best I can in the book, but really it's the visuals and the illustrations that make that book to me unique. Mm-hmm. So if you want to talk about something other than that, I think that's a good way to go. Wonderful. Because, um, so I'm going to recommend my listeners. Uh, he's a really cool guy, Brady. So check out his, uh, his podcast, citizenbitcoin.world. There it is. Kiara Bickers, Bitcoin Clarity, Bitcoin Challenges and Adversarial Thinking. So, um, so, Especially when it comes, you know, to the to the uh, to the uh, analysis or or you know description of um, how you build up the book, you know the the, the structure, the concept, and everything. Uh, I'll also recommend not not very many people listen to this podcast, but I enjoyed doing it a ton. It was so good. It was a Bitcoin Magazine podcast, mm-hmm. and oh, that yeah. one was just amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. 
So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, Kiara, um, I wanted to talk to you about, because I, I find your background and your, you know, your whole open-minded approach to everything. I, 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 because, I, you know, I think, in my opinion, the people who, uh, you, you self-admittedly, you admit that on your website, you dropped out sort of your college and high school. And I think those people that drop out that are sort of out of outside the box and can think outside the box are more open-minded, more innovative, more creative in their thinking. Now, why don't you, you know, tell my listeners still, you know, a brief, um, not even brief, but just to take your time. Uh, uh, how did you, what was the path to Bitcoin? I know, I know it's not one thing, but what was it then that made click sure. for you when, once you understood the essence, the purpose and the, you know, your vision of Bitcoin? Well, so the goal of writing the book, Bitcoin Clarity, was to get other people to that same aha moment I had. Now, no one's going to have it in the exact same place, but I think for me, back in 2012, I was working as a server on the Stanford campus and I was driving to and from work an hour and I loved it. I loved the job. It was sort of a dead end thing. Like I, I like you mentioned, I dropped out of college, but it was very flexible and I had the opportunity to study whatever I wanted at home on the side and I made enough money to sort of get by. And that worked out really well for me because what I was doing is an hour to work and an hour back every day, I would listen to the Mises Institute podcasts. So for people who have gone to college and studied economics, what they teach you is Keynesianism. They'll teach you a little bit about like Mises, uh, not a little bit about Mises, like they'll mention him. Uh, it, it's, it's very much a footnote. And when I was listening to the Mises podcast, I was essentially like indoctrinating myself with this Austrian branded economics. And when I first saw Bitcoin, which was around the same time, you have to imagine like Ron Paul was this libertarian at the time who was kind of getting shafted in the Republican debates many years ago already at this point. And I was starting to see that there was this counter narrative to the mainstream political doctrine, right? It's like you had the left and the right, and then you had these libertarians that to me had this very interesting uh, agenda but they were intentionally being censored and all this stuff and deplatformed and you know times have changed quite a bit since then but when i originally saw the value prop of bitcoin as being something that was scarce it took me really it took me understanding understanding economics enough to recognize the value of bitcoin and then once other people saw the value in bitcoin like i saw bitcoin go from you know, several dollars to $10 and then from $10 to $1,000. And then it really, I, I mean, I was just a college student at the time, so I wasn't investing large amounts of money, you know, and I wouldn't have called it investing. I would have called it gambling at the time. Uh, I saw it crash during the time of the Silk Road. When the Silk Road got busted, it went from a, like $1,000 back to 100 And my, you know, then girlfriend at the time was telling me, look, if you care about Bitcoin, like if you want to keep ranting about Bitcoin, that's fine, but you should probably like do something about it at this point. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, put your Getting money where your mouth is. Exactly. So I decided to buy some Bitcoin and then I was like invested. Right. And that was very, very early on. And, you know, it, the, it, so long ago already, but what I wanted to do after I had kind of, you know, bought into this thing is I really wanted to understand it more. So I would ask my friends who were in college, who were programmers, like, hey, how do I learn more about Bitcoin? And unanimously, they all said, you should learn how to code. So I spent a year learning C++ and like got functionally nowhere. Like anyone who is a very talented programmer or even an amateur programmer knows that a year really isn't enough time to do anything proficient, especially in C++ or some sort of like low level language like that. And it was, it was, it was kind of heartbreaking to me because I spent all this time learning how to code. And then I went back to the Bitcoin code base, right? Cause it's open source. And I did not understand anything about Bitcoin. I didn't understand how any of the functions operated, how any of the architecture was designed. I didn't understand any of it. So I realized that I was sort of walking down the wrong path, but there wasn't much to do other than to keep walking down that path. Like, you know, at the time, the Bitcoin books that existed were very technical. If you were to Google anything, and this is still true today, if you Google anything about Bitcoin, it's all very, very technical. Occasionally, you'll find, you know, kind of like hypey economics pieces and like that. That's cool, too. But what I really wanted was something to explain Bitcoin as a system. So, you know, fast forward many years, I ended up getting a job in the industry through being a developer, started out as an intern, got a job as a system, as system administrator working at Blockstream, very close to some of the core developers, now 
the company has changed over time and it's it's not the the bitcoin ecosystem has changed like when i first got into bitcoin there was functionally one and then there was you know the the hard fork and the split and bitcoin cash and i what i feel is that bitcoin was hard enough for me to learn years ago and it's much harder for people to learn now because there's so many different contradicting narratives that i think it would be it would i being humble about what i know now and being realistic it, there's a very high probability that i could have walked down the path of like believing in bitcoin cash over bitcoin or you know it, because it's so easy to get misled you know all it takes is watching the the wrong video before the right video or watching listening to one person who you find charismatic it's so easy to be misled by sort of you know maybe even well-intentioned information but that's just incorrect so when I got to the point where I had really felt that I had understood something about Bitcoin, I wanted to give something back and do something that I didn't see in the ecosystem. So, you know, to contrast what the book I wrote, Bitcoin Clarity, is to what I saw in the rest of the space was I feel that a lot of the people in Bitcoin think very analytically, which means they look at the system and they break it apart trying to explain it. And, you know, imagine trying to explain to your grandmother, like, how to use Bitcoin. Like, it doesn't work. Like, my grandmother would have to take notes to use a washing machine. Right. And that's what I don't do in Bitcoin Clarity is I don't water anything down. Like I actually give very, very low level information about how the system works. But my intent is to do it with mental models and without the overwhelming tech jargon. Right. It's like if I give you a term, I need to give you the term like UTXOs before I can define, you know, what fees are. Like I try and pace things out in a proper way and not just break the system in, in, into pieces in a way that isn't coherent and doesn't make sense. Uh, hopefully that's that helps people. But, you know, it's one of the things, one of the challenges that I'm facing right now is how do you reach that new audience of Bitcoiners? Like every time the price goes up, you get this wave of new Bitcoiners, uh, but they're not always the easiest to reach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the people who have been consuming the book have been longtime Bitcoiners, people who have already read all the Bitcoin books. So yeah, it's been a challenge, but you know, you, you really asked like what my experience with Bitcoin was and how I got started. And that's, that's sort of the story as I see it. You know what I find fascinating, as you said, uh, you, you know, you taught yourself, uh, amongst other fields of knowledge, Austrian economics. Now, if I had like, you know, at least, you know, we don't, we don't get taught that in school and no. even, even, I mean, I'm, I studied law, you know, but I even have a, you know, PhD in law, but, but, you know, you never learn anything. I mean, uh, even university students, you know, who study or professors, they, maybe they, you know, they mention well, once upon a time, you know, they, they might have been taught about a little bit about Hayek or something like that, but that's it. You know, did you like understand the hardness of money? Like the essence of, you know, what is Bitcoin, the limited supply, the absolute scarcity, like the real fundamental properties, monetary properties? Yeah, I think, well, I guess if I were to be sort of silly about it, I would say I probably have like a natural version to overcomplication. Like to me, there's a lot of bullshit that goes on in universities where people are trying to get PhDs or people are trying to say something intelligent so they make things more complicated. <laughs> And I see this with a lot of my high IQ friends is that they think that they believe they're really intelligent and they're kind of, they need to entertain themselves, right? And in order to entertain themselves, they need to make things more complicated. Yeah. But I've never, I view that as like fun and cute, but it's not actually true, right? And a lot of the stuff that you learn in, in traditional Keynesian e economics is all this complicated stuff that just seemed to me to be intuitively wrong. And when you learn, like for instance, to keep it simple, because we're talking about simplicity here, like when you learn about traditional economists, they don't talk about behavioral like psychology at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and the Austrian economists are the only ones who seem to integrate behavioral psychology. And I don't know what is more behavioral than, you know, what the desires of people and buying things with their money, right? You could look at things like why people are even motivated to buy things like toilet paper or toothpaste, right? It's, you have to use psychology in order to convince people that these are things worth buying. And that's very much true of Bitcoin. Like, yes, Bitcoin is scarce, but what's sort of more interesting is that people find scarcity valuable, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this behavioral approach to how Bitcoin was positioned. Bitcoin is valuable because people believe scarcity is valuable, but, you know, Ethereum has the minds and hearts of many people and it's not scarce to any degree. So there people value, you know, the hope, hopium, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not necessarily a criticism. It's mostly just recognizing what the market finds valuable and that's all based in behavior psychology not just the principles of like strict economic rules and one of the things that austrians say is that uh, 
at least, you know, I can't remember which Austrian had said this, but the idea that you can't know perfect, you don't have perfect information of what the market would do because you don't know what everyone mm -hmm. believes. Yeah. Right. And that struck me as intuitively true. And it, it, it cancels out all the complicated math problems that really intelligent people like to do. Because it's a dynamic, spontaneous, emerging, right? Uh, sort of interconnected. I don't know. We don't I want think to intelligent people just don't like to admit that they can't know everything. Mm -hmm. And you can't know what would drive, like there are trends, definitely. Like we know that people value scarcity, but you can't know, like if you remember from the early days of Bitcoin, like people were experimenting in altcoins what things people found valuable. They would make something more scarce than Bitcoin and people didn't want that. They would make something more divisible than Bitcoin and people didn't want that. So it's not just like these hard and fast rules of the most scarce thing wins. Like you have to have the network effects, you have to have the branding. And Bitcoin did a great job with branding without having a leader, right? Because it had that story of coming to birth during the traditional financial collapse. Like that's, that story is very compelling. <laughs> the, the calling it a Genesis block, like you're not gonna get better marketing than that. That was such a good play um, from my perspective. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question about like studying Austrian economics, I think I got lucky in discovering the Mises Institute. I had a couple people on YouTube that I was watching that told me to read Ayn Rand. And then through that, I found, you know, Ron Paul and found the Mises Institute. But I think it's really easy for young people to hear something slightly different and then go a totally different direction. I try and be sympathetic to that because it's really hard to unlearn incorrect information. Mm -hmm. You know, I find it so important that uh, especially, let me, let me uh, because I want to sort of um, go into uh, this tangent, but I'm trying to find a smooth transition to that topic no still. Feel um, free to like, interrupt me or whenever. Yeah, yeah. Um, Listen, I mean, Kiara, um, you know what, when I, when I listen or read, you know, to, or listen, or when we listen to all these podcasts, it's, uh, it's, uh, it seems like there are some aspects of Bitcoin that is like so far fetched maybe for some people, because maybe we have some become so conditioned in our society, not even to think about it now. Okay. Let me, uh, let me just, let me just address this quickly. I, I mean, think it it's might, true, but yeah. Yeah. And it might sound a little bit kitsch, but, um, you know, this our whole society and civilization is so uh, not only centralized, but but chauvinistically male dominant. And like, mm -hmm. why don't, you know, more women, more female spirits like yourself with different, you know, perspectives and approaches come forward? Because there's so many you know, bright minds out there. I just had an interview also with Elizabeth Profontaine from Canada. She also said something similar, like, you know, people, people like in a financial or whatever capital market industry, they want to make like complexity look smart, yes. <laughs> you know? And, and I'm like, um, now before I uh, lose my red threads uh, somewhere, sure. in there, um, don't you think that Bitcoin is like the fundamental, it's not going to fix everything instantaneously, but don't you think like Bitcoin could, once it's, I call it that once it monit like we have the monitor root layering of Bitcoin, it could like loosen up and, and really deroute this whole, you know, uh, male dominant centralized structures. And, you know, there's so much complaining about inequality, income inequality. I mean, even in the Western world, you know, in Europe, for example, here, sure. why don't we, you know, tackle these problems at the root, you know, to politics, not going to solve that. What, what do you, what, what's your perspective here? Yeah, I think maybe different than other females, I, I sort of take a, a biological approach to this. And I think that money is probably not the root of male dominance. Like it, if you if you look at the dominance hierarchy, you know, if you look at CEOs or people in, in positions of power, let's say, perceived positions of power, real positions of power, whatever it is, it tends to be more male dominated. I don't think that's because of money. I think that's just because of testosterone and the nature of men. Mm -hmm. uh, men tend to be more aggressive and when i look at my own personality and my social circle of female friends all of us it's it's quite funny we were all intjs on the briggs myers test so there's this very the type of woman who is interested in intellectual conversations and studying economics is very very rare and i'm not that's not a surprise to me at all like i don't have female friends really i have a few in bitcoin but when i was younger i was by far the only female i knew that was interested in any of these types of topics so yeah, I think that's, it's probably some wiring in the brain and that may be like a controversial thing to say, but I think, you know, men are more interested in systems, breaking things apart, putting things back together. I don't think that's a cultural thing. Unfortunately, I, I think it's probably just a biological thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't think money is at the root of it either, but you know, talking about the potential for Bitcoin to rewire the way our society works, the way that I look at it, because you know, a lot of Bitcoiners sort of see, I think Bitcoiners view Bitcoin as still the underdog. And I no longer see it that way necessarily. You know, like there's this, this is undertone to conversations in the Bitcoin space that Bitcoin has yet to dominate. Like, oh, we're just getting started, we're just getting started. And that might be, that's definitely true, but we've already come so far and we're already doing so much better. Like, I guess the way that I, th that I view it is really the opportunity, the, the fact that Bitcoin exists as, a, as something different than fiat is already a win. And you'll never get the same sort of dominance as a dollar or other fiat currencies unless they fully break, right? Because you are forced to pay your taxes in those currencies. Uh, you know, and until, until they do break, or if they do break, then, you know, then Bitcoin can become an alternative. But people who are in control, and you talked about how we're all so used to these centralized systems of control, would never want something like Bitcoin, because you can't control it. It's like, even as an investment, you know, you can control your business, you can control your podcast, you can control what type of money you bring in, what type of marketing you do, and you can ramp that up, you can make your business 10x or 100x, or you could have it just flatline if that's where you're comfortable, right? But with Bitcoin as an investment, you can't, it's not up to you. And that's not something that people who enjoy control, who like to climb the dominance hierarchy really find interesting. You know, especially people like, if I were to talk to, you know, someone in a very rich position, like someone in a family office or someone managing hedge funds or someone like managing, you know, millions or billions of dollars, these people don't find Bitcoin innately that interesting because it's not, it's hard to predict in that it's not like a company that you have predicted revenue, right? And that's not to say it's not valuable. It, it, it definitely is, but it's just, it's so not in line with the traditional way of thinking. Yeah. Oh, let me, oh yeah. You know, when I, when I listened to, uh, I think it was an interview with Greg Braden, I, I like him because he's got a scientific approach. So he said, um, after studying and analyzing everything, he said that we have like adopted, uh, this uh, this attitude or this mentality of Darwinism it's it's all about you know competition competition and do you think like Bitcoin leads to a new civilization where we have true uh, you know uh, cooperation like real dynamic cooperation uh, decentralized com uh, cooperation we want to call it uh, where you know this is I mean I have a clear vision once Bitcoin really ossifies and you know the, we have monetary root layering and as I would call it don't you think like you know not only on a social level, but technological, scientific level, everything is going to really blossom and, and flourish. Uh, and Maybe I'm more of a pessimist in this way. And <laughs> the way that I view Bitcoin, at least like when I talk about the origins of it, you know how it, Bitcoin fit into the niche of what people already wanted. It, present, it was during the financial collapse, not just in the US, but all over the world. People were hurting, they were vulnerable, and they wanted something distinctly different. Bitcoin came onto the scene at that time, and for years it was doubted and not believed to be anything worth value. Like, Bitcoin's a scam, Bitcoin's a scam. For years, that's all I heard. All My entire family, all my friend circles were like, why are you wasting your time with this thing, right? There was extreme doubt and, and skepticism. But still, the story was enough to compel people like me who are thinking libertarian-like. Right now, when I, when I look at the technology, I say the technology has the opportunity to win the hearts and minds of people who already think a certain way, I don't think it has the power to change the way people think. Uh, like, I don't see, even not, I don't not see even, Bitcoin. Even, uh, long term, like, like over, let's say, decades to come. I think it has to be more than just a technology. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think Instagram changed the way people think. I don't think Facebook changed the way people think. I think it just exposed how we would think or how we would act if that technology existed. Right? Like Do you Facebook think Bitcoin would create the structures for that, the architecture would that often, you know, Andreas Antonopoulos talks about like the foundation, the healthy soil in, you know, in the first place in order to, you know, to create those new, you know, uh, the second, third layer, whatever social educational uh, production, you know, scientific technological layers. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's got to be some architecture that we are not seeing. Maybe it's so, so much in plain sight. Uh, I think it gives the people who think like us to have something to go to because before Bitcoin, the only option was gold, right? And like, if you're a libertarian minded person and you're living in this world of just fiat currency, you had no option. You had nothing to go to. Now, certainly if people are so dissatisfied with fiat, everyone could move to this system, 
but people in power are never going to just willingly give up that control. Like the federal reserve is never going to give up the control to print money. Like that's not happening. They're never going to just like roll over and let China become the new world re reserve currency. Like it's not, it's not going to happen. What they'll do to put up a fight. I don't know. And so much of Bitcoin success sort of has to do with the way people in power, you know, decide to run their own currency because Bitcoin is a comp is a competitor to those things. Do I think Bitcoin is, you know, bringing out some more compassionate side of us? I'm super skeptical of that, uh, I don't see that in the Bitcoin space, but you know, it's, and the, the nature of what Bitcoin is, is going to change as the community grows. And I've already seen that. I'm sure you have too, right? Like it was a very different type of thing, you know, five years ago. Do you see, I mean, uh, okay. So let's go to the practical aspects now that you, uh, you, you talked about sort of adoption, I think sort of you paraphrasing it, but do you see like critical adoption rate coming in the very new future? Not mass adoption. I'm talking about like two, three, four percent, whatever, maximum five percent of the Earth's population, like finally getting it. Like, wow, this is this is at the core of it. It's about freedom. It's about true decentralization. It's about true, you know, true human rights. Of, of... Yeah. Sometimes I think about this, and I think we might already be in that phase because, like, so. Bitcoin, in order to onboard onto Bitcoin, you have to voluntarily decide of your own free will that this is a currency worth using, right? And there's this huge energy barrier of like all the stuff you have to learn in order to get over that hump and then like see the value on the other side. How you get more people over that energy barrier is something I'm trying to figure out because I'm, I'm a big believer in never just telling someone what they should do. Like, I don't mm -hmm. tell my family what they should do. I tell people what Bitcoin is, but so many people just look at me like blankly. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, I think we might already be in that point, but if Bitcoin was ever really, really crucially needed, I think there would be so much chaos surrounding that, mm -hmm. that whatever, whatever event caused the need for Bitcoin that, it wouldn't be a top priority or the, the narrative around Bitcoin would totally change. Okay. What, yeah, that may be kind mm -hmm. of vague because it's hard to speculate. It's hard to speculate. But if you could imagine if there was like some sort of global economic collapse and governments were hurting and Bitcoin was soaring in value and everyone in the Bitcoin space was getting in, like 10xing their money, who would be public enemy number one at that point? It would be all of Bitcoiners, right? It would be every, it would be Bitcoin itself. So, you know, people who are still in that very much like normie framework, trying to convince them that Bitcoin is an ethical alternative to the dollar, that Bitcoin, you know, isn't something that's forced on you. People don't understand that. And that's, if that were true, people, if, if that were true and people really believe that everyone would just stop paying their taxes, right? Because they'd be like, oh, this is theft. Uh, like this is paying for wars overseas that I don't support, but that's not how it works, right? People are in the mindset of, I pay taxes because I'm like a good person. I'll try and pay as, as little as possible. But ultimately, this is what a good citizen does that's enforced by the military power of the U.S. You may not support wars overseas, but you'll support it financially because you're forced to and you make, it makes you feel like you're a good person. Uh, I mean, certainly no one's proud of you for do dodging your taxes in the U.S., right? That's not like an ethical stance, right. which is why I'd be skeptical of people you know, thinking Bitcoin is something that could potentially be a more ethical alternative. Like really what people are afraid of is volatility. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely something that would happen in Bitcoin because it's not backed by force. You know, like the government can control to some degree, even though we have inflation and the, the prices of things are going up, they can control that the price goes up steadily. And that's what most people want. <laughs> mm -hmm. But also most people aren't investors. Most people don't think long-term. Maybe the game really is, you know, thinking about the, the other Bitcoin book that was written by Saifedean, right? The, the goal is really to get people to think long-term. Because if you can turn someone who's a short-term thinker into a long-term thinker, then you have the opportunity to sort of black pill them on things like Bitcoin. Until that happens, though, people are just living for the weekend. I mean, most of the millennials I know don't, don't have much of a savings, if any. It's a very difficult conversation to have. With most with most people mm -hmm. what's what's the approach by people i mean when you when you interact or you know talk to people when they approach you like ask you about bitcoin now besides you know the wealth or whatever or savings as a savings technology as a capital uh, escape or as a speculation you know 
which even the Fed chairman admitted <laughs> it's a digital gold. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's amazing, right? Amazing times. So what I'm sometimes wondering, are there people that, that, uh, that I mean, have not, never approached me, but, but do you think people would come up to you and say, Okay, but what would you, what would change for us for you know as a as a collective as a society you know whether it's in a in a, in a municipality a community or in a in a state or you know in a country what would change I mean our would our, would our lives change and how I've never never heard that question you know this is what what, I'm, what intrigues me. Yeah, I think so. Some of my political background, like before I was interested in Bitcoin or even like in the early days of it, I was, I definitely labeled myself like a voluntarist or like an anarcho capitalist. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've sort of pulled back from that because it's like, oh my goodness, it's like maybe that could be the conversation in like a hundred years. But right now, like people still think communism is a good idea. Like maybe it's a little too soon. I think there's this like, famous philosopher out of China that said something along the, the there was talk about like, um, gosh, I don't, I, I don't want to ruin what he said. So I'll have to really <laughs> paraphrase it. But basically the idea is you can only have as good of a population. You can only have as good of a government as you do the, the, the ethics of the core people. Right. So like what we're talking about, having a society that's based on volunteerism, having a money that's based on volunteerism, doing things that would have been done with taxes, but voluntarily is so far away. Um, that I don't know if it's really feasible in the near future at all. Um, I think it's nice that Bitcoin exists. I think it's, it's important that it does, but it's not, it's, it's, I don't see it as like the, the building ground for this new, this new utopian society because like you have to be realistic and like looking at the world right now, like who's going to be the, the nominee in the U S right. It's like huge, like hugely rich capitalist or, you know, complete socialist. It has been, outright communists at times for many, many years. Yeah. Like it's not, <laughs> nothing about that screams society ready for volunteerism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I was, I forgot something to what I was going to say, but um, so um, do you think um, the people are overwhelmed when, when it comes like, let's say, you know, people are ready. They, they say, okay, they, you know, they want to buy some Bitcoin, like when it comes to security, privacy, the handling of the hardware, the, all this, you know, all this, uh, sometimes I'm, I don't know whether the Bit our Bitcoin friends, you know, the, the product developers, the, the, especially the coders, programmers, uh, we really understand empathetically what people like average, really the average person out there on the street really going through. I mean, yeah, can, no, do you that's think it's realistic? Correct. Yeah. It's a hundred percent correct. And like, you know, especially being someone who works in one of the more technical niches of, of Bitcoin, I'm constantly hearing things like, you're not really using Bitcoin unless you're running a full node yeah. or like the future of Bitcoin is using Bitcoins and satellites when, you know, Russia sets down the internet and like all those things are great. And I'm pro cypherpunk future, a hundred percent. You have to understand though, that it's going to be like one, a fraction of 1% of people that are going to be doing that type of stuff. And you know, maybe using exchanges and leaving your money on exchange isn't a great practice. I certainly wouldn't recommend it for people who are storing their money long term. But, you know, Coinbase has done a lot of good for the for the Bitcoin ecosystem on onboarding users who have heard about Bitcoin. Like if you r recall from my own story, what's the first thing I did before I learned about Bitcoin? Well, I bought some first. And then it took me years to understand Bitcoin, learning how to code, reading every Bitcoin book, getting a job in this space. I, it probably took me having to write the book in order for me to really feel like I understood some things about it. And I'm sure, you know, there are people who are working on Bitcoin today who are, are working on their little piece of Bitcoin and don't understand anything behind that. So it's just, yeah, I think we're definitely, you use the word empathetic and no, like we're not empathetic to anyone who's getting into Bitcoin at all. You know, hitting people with all these rules about like what you have to do with Bitcoin in order to be secure. Like Bitcoiners have a lot of fear because that fear is what sort of excites them for the future. It's like, oh my gosh, the economy might collapse. Therefore, I will do great, right? It's sort of like a prepper mentality. But that's not the normal person. And it's like, maybe we're not trying to reach the normal person. Like, maybe that's totally fine. Um, I know that a lot of the belief in the Bitcoin space, like, you know, with Bitcoin, Twitter and whatnot, is you have to be as over the top as possible for, for normies to sort of get it. And maybe that's true. I, but 
to me, it's like that also is part of what makes Bitcoin look sort of scammy is like all these people who all they talk about is Bitcoin 24 seven for years. And they're like to the moon. It's it, it, it attracts a certain type of person. It doesn't attract a cautious, reasonable type of person. It attracts a type of person who wants to get rich quick not really thinking long-term or it attracts the analytically minded person who's willing to spend two, three years to learn about something and then understand why people believe in it so strongly. Right. But it doesn't attract women because women, women mm -hmm. want safety, security, like uh, stability and men are willing to take risk. Right. So you have all this like young men interested in Bitcoin because that's the mentality of the Bitcoin ecosystem. It's like fast, it's risky, it's energetic. And there's nothing really stable about it. Mm -hmm. But that positive, I mean, a positive note, I mean, I, I hear, you know, also from my girlfriend's brother and other people are like, wow, like new people coming into the space, totally like total noobs, noobs. Yeah. And they're asking like, hey, you know, maybe I should buy some Bitcoin. I'm like, wow, you know, what happened in the meantime? You know, like uh, <laughs> this, it's really weird. So. Uh, something is happening, and you know it's independently. You know whether they're male, female, whatever class or social. Well, it was the best performing asset, and that's not something that people can easily ignore. Exactly. Yeah. Right, and we talk about at least I talk about Bitcoin in the very technical sense about like what Bitcoin is, how it's potentially this like more ethical form of money, how it's a hedge against the dollar, how you can use it peer to peer, and there's all these cool properties of the system that people like you and I would nerd out on. But that's not what the average person hears. And maybe that's okay, right? Maybe it's okay because they hear, oh, this was the best performing asset. That's weird, right? And they buy some and then they are encouraged to learn more about it. And then they're, you know, red-pilled or blood-pilled through that, through that action. I'm, I, I'm definitely in support of that. Um, you know, but I just, I try and stay positive, but I've heard so many crazy things. I've heard people like sold their house to buy Bitcoin. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's it, a it's like, I mean, that's just crazy. It's, it, it's just irresponsible. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy. And you just have to think like, okay, there's the bell curve and there's a whole bunch of people yeah. who are in the Bitcoin space or in any space that involves money and they're just going to do irresponsible things. And that's just part of it. Yeah. Right? And all we can really do is say the narrative of like, what's interesting about Bitcoin? What are the properties of the system? Like, why is it interesting censorship resistance and hope that that sort of message can propagate out. Right. You know, I mean, to put a little bit of relativity into my uh, previously uh, s s negative sounding statements, I mean, there are some really, I mean, uh, I'm a huge fan of Casa, of Blockstream with their Blockstream Green Wallet. I mean, it's really, it's, 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 it's a no brainer. I mean, if, if, if people already know how to, you know, how to deal with internet, with apps. And so yep. I guess the transition is not that hard, but if we could just make it a little bit more smooth, a little bit more user friendly, user experience, user interface, uh, you know, a better improve it. So yeah. Um, do you see that coming in the next few years? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but what I'm trying to do personally is like I, what I, what I think I'm going to do is I'm probably going to start a podcast too. And instead of yeah. interviewing people in the Bitcoin space, what I want to do is interview outsiders mm -hmm. on their area of expertise and then sort of pitch them on Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. So yeah, and you, are, and you also have your YouTube video. I, I, I subscribed, by the way, just recently. To yeah. You. I just I was just listening to your why, why I wrote uh, Bitcoin Clarity. It was a pretty cool video. Um, so in the last 20 minutes we have, I want to let you talk. Uh, when, when you fuse your, you know, your comprehension, your knowledge with your heart and your soul, what is the message you really want to get over to, you know, to all the people out there? Gosh, that's a great question. Bitcoin clarity, like, I mean, the, the clarifies I mean, for Bitcoiners, it. <laughs> what's at the forefront of my mind for Bitcoiners is, is to have empathy for new users, you know, and when it's, again, when it comes to Bitcoiners trying to figure out what to do in the space, I think for me, I, I talk about this a little bit in the book, but I tried to figure out like, what could I do to add value to the space? And it's, I think that's a challenging question for a lot of people because you know, like, okay, there are already hardware wallets. There are already like every, everything you can think of, there's already some version of that, but mm -hmm. I think it's a snowball effect, right? And we're a very passionate group of people <laughs> like as a community. And it's definitely a community. Like people really want to contribute and it's not always easy. Like you don't have to work at a Bitcoin company to contribute, you know, putting out great quality content and educating new users is what I'm most passionate about right now. Um, I recognize that a lot of people don't read books. Americans only read on average one book a year, or the average American only reads one book a year. 
so I'm taking the book, which is primarily based in illustrations. And I had, you know, some guy who I could barely communicate with in Russia, translate everything into animations. And then I'm going to launch a whole bunch of videos that go with that. Cool. And hopefully that'll, you know, add, add a little bit to the, to the conversation and make it a little bit easier for some people to understand, you know, basic things like UTXOs or fees or something like that, mining, explaining everything in what I view as a simpler way. You know, sometimes it takes 20 different people to explain the thing and we're all going to reach different portions of the audience. Some people will understand my explanations. Some people will understand, you know, more economic explanation and like I'm really making it my mission in 2020 and the next couple of years is to reach as far out of the Bitcoin existing ecosystem as possible. It can be very easy to want recognition of your existing tribe because let's say you're on Bitcoin Twitter or something like that, right? If you post something that you know Bitcoiners are going to like and you know that's your audience, everyone is going to retweet that and you get this immediate validation. It's, it's very easy to, I don't want to say pander, but to sort of to signal to your existing tribe. It's much harder to go out and reach new people and, con and convert, but that's what grows your existing base. And I think that's what we, we should probably turn our focus to. You know, like I'm not, I'm not a, a developer building lightning and those guys kind of got it covered. I'm not a developer working on Bitcoin, but they, they kind of got it covered. Like, <laughs> you gotta figure out what you can contribute to and double down on that. So that's my mission for the, for the year. Cool. Um, so, uh, where do you where do you see us where do you see us in where do you see our community where do you see you know our this whole planet i mean in, in 10 years in 10 15 years to come you know i i don't follow the markets that closely but it clearly can't go on in the way that it's in, in the way that it's going the idea that you can just inflate the currency it it's, doesn't seem to be stable to me and i don't know when that means you know some sort of economic collapse but just from a psychology perspective i don't, I, I i think eventually this is going to break people the idea that money is backed by nothing and that the us government merely has control of everyone through its currency you know and military like the, it, we're okay with it for now because everything is sort of working but it's such a delicate system that could break over over quite a number of things, right? And so it's it's hard to predict the timeline of when that stuff will occur, but certainly the, the trade war that's going on with China is something that I pay close attention to because China is probably the, the biggest existential threat to the dollar. And then, you know, if the dollar collapses, that's great for Bitcoin, but then we become sort of more of a target when that, when that mm -hmm. happens. I think Bitcoiners can definitely handle it. Um, I'm sure, you know, all the, you know, everyone will be on Twitter defending Bitcoin immediately. <laughs> But, you know, where do I see people going in the next 10 years? I, hopefully growing and, and having the people who are in this industry understand more of it. Like, you'll recall, you know, 2017, 2018, everyone was really hyped on the idea of, like, n not just altcoins, but, like, ICOs. And I think slowly over time, people, especially as a community, are starting, starting to understand, oh, this app or DAP promised the moon and gave us nothing right and you can only get away with that so many times and that's why you see that whole like everything's a scam meme sort of happening is because well what well if you over promise you better over deliver mm -hmm. and there's so much the only thing that's really not falling short is bitcoin by being the the most dominant cryptocurrency in the ecosystem so I see a lot of the altcoins probably continuing to drop a lot of, I think it's going to be harder and harder for new smart contract platforms to onboard new users as they're competing with each other. And none of them are really delivering the type of value that they initially promised. Um, it's also just hard to develop these products on top of blockchains because it's hard to update blockchains. So it's like, you know, you're building a product on top of this sort of immutable ledger. It's it's very, and maybe a couple people will be able to do it successfully, but I don't think that's going to happen soon. Hopefully lightning will be something that happens in the next couple of years and actually is super usable. And maybe that'll be a way that we can onboard more merchants into using Bitcoin. I, I sell my book in Bitcoin. I try, I'm probably going to put more merch up there and just sell things in Bitcoin. I think that's what a lot of normies want to see is like, well, what can I buy with Bitcoin? And then they buy Bitcoin and realize, oh, I don't want to spend it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and this proverbial, like, you know, buying the coffee, whatever with, with Bitcoin, I think once this lightning ecosystem evolves and the technology becomes really like sophisticated, like super smooth and easy and uh, with everything is going on, even with Jack Mahler's whatever strike. I mean, I have a high hopes for this, uh, for this strike thing because people you know can for the first time also pay 
whether they want to or not, but they would actually pay uh, eventually to the merchant in Bitcoin and bit the, uh, the merchant would, would receive it in Bitcoin, but the right. customer wouldn't have to think about it. They just, you know, they just, uh, they would, they could, I mean, it's just, I mean, just, uh, uh, the vision of it is it, beautiful because people wouldn't wouldn't even have to think about Bitcoin because it would just be you know a debit bank account and and over the lightning right. Well, what's your yeah take yeah that? I think well to me what would actually stimulate spending of Bitcoin is not just the ability to payment side. So like if more Bitcoin companies start paying people in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. I think that would grow the desire to spend it. Like if my only income was in Bitcoin, then I would have to spend in Bitcoin. Like I'm not going to not pay rent. I'm not going to not buy to spend in Bitcoin. But that only works if it's not something you're trying to save. Most people are buying Bitcoin trying to save it or trying to, you know, make money off the, the volatility of it. So they're only buying it to, to resell, not so maybe that's the really game changing thing in the ecosystem is, you know, long time Bitcoiners hold enough Bitcoin to the point where they want to start spending it, reinvesting some of it. It's hard to say, but, you know, I'm definitely, I'm mean, no matter what direction or what, what vision you have of the future of Bitcoin, like the fact that there are more people in the ecosystem and all of them are dying to contribute in some way is super promising to me. Very exciting. And All exciting. Right. It's actually really <laughs> fun to, to be in Bitcoin right now. Fantastic. So, Kiara, uh, do you want to like uh, give my listeners any other information besides your Twitter handle, your your website, get, get bitcoinclarity.com. We're going to put those in the show notes. But any other resources you want to direct? Yeah, put it in the show notes. And then I'm going to be releasing the book on Amazon. I'm really hoping to kind of give it a big push when it launches. So I'll probably yeah. bring the price down for the launch on Amazon. It'll be more than just the ebook. I'll do the paperback and all that stuff. And yeah, I think maybe in the future I'll write another book called Crypto Chaos and, and document the history of all the different altcoins that were tried and failed. Um, so fun but story. yeah, no, it was really fun talking to you. I enjoyed doing your podcast. So thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Kiara. All right. Talk to you later. Have a good Bye. day. Bye-bye. All right. So really enjoyed my talk with Kiara Bickers. Uh, Make sure you uh, check out our website, getbitconcarity.com. You can find us on Twitter. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, hit me up at hello at, hello at thetotalconnector.com. This is uh, her website, getbitconcarity.com. And listen to the, to the other podcast interviews she did with, uh, for example, with Brady from Citizen Bitcoin. And yeah, um, hope you loved it as much as I did. Uh, if you're an ethical sponsor, please uh, get in touch with me. I'm really looking for ethical Bitcoin sponsors so I can really deliver high quality face-to-face -face interviews, video and or podcast, and also make some documentaries. And thanks so much for supporting and for listening. And I'll see you soon again. Total Bitcoin. Bye.